Scripture reading this morning will come from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. Galatians 6, 6 through 10. Before we read that this morning, let us go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, loving Father, we come to you this morning with thankfulness in our hearts, thanking you for your forgiving love, the unboundless grace that you have provided us, and that grace that has sought us in a world of sin and has found us. We are thankful, Father, for that grace that caused us to see when we were blind and that has caused us to be found when we were lost. We are thankful this morning, Father, that as men and women around the world come together and to worship your name, that we have a bond with one another. Even though we have never met one another and we may never meet one another, we share a love and a dedication to follow your will and your word. And we pray, Father, this morning that you continue to bless your church as you have for centuries, that you help us, Father, to stay steadfast, that you help us to have the heart and mind of faithful followers, Father. And help us, Father, above all things, that we withstand the wiles of the devil and that we stand strong in the world in which we live today. We pray, Father, that as we continue to take a message of hope to a lost generation, that we might find a way to prick their hearts and to open their minds and to share with them a love that they have never known. To tell them the story of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his love and his willingness to come to this earth and to give his life for us. And we pray, Father, that that message would resonate with the world today and that they might find a love for you and for your son and for his sacrifice. And we pray, Father, that they might join the numbers of individuals that are a remnant compared to the size of the world today that come together in steadfastness and in dedication to remember that sacrifice and to worship you not only for your holiness, but for all the many blessings that you continually bestow upon your people. And ultimately that, Father, of the forgiveness of our sins. And we are thankful this morning, Father, that regardless of how many times that we may stray and that we may fall, that we know that you are there with open arms to pick us up, to forgive us, and to continue to grant us strength as we go on this path of life. We pray, Father, this morning that you would be with those of our number that are struggling spiritually, Father, that have a weak heart at this time. And we pray, Father, that you would grant them the strength that they need to carry on and to be steadfast and to have an unmovable and an unshakable faith in you. We pray that you would be with those of our number that are sick or that are shut in or unable to be with us and that you be able to, Father, heal them where modern man medicine cannot we pray that you would minister to our needs and those things that we don't even know that we need to ask you for, Father, and we don't know how to ask. And we are thankful, Father, for the intercession of your Spirit and that he is there for us. And we pray all these things through your Son's name on high, Jesus the Christ. And amen. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. <clears throat> Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Good morning. It's wonderful to see everybody here. Always overjoyed to get to worship with uh, my church family every Sunday. And uh, always love to see you here. A favorite phrase of lazy people everywhere is don't sweat the small stuff. 
This is one of my favorite phrases. <laughs> Particularly when it's told by somebody who has given you a task, usually something along the lines of cleaning or something like that. And uh, we all know what it means. Just make sure you get the job generally done. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect. There can be a couple of things left over. You know, you don't have to get every last little spot. And uh, honestly, if you're ever in, uh, in charge of anybody on that kind of task, if you want to become real popular real quick, that's a phrase you ought to get acquainted with. And honestly, there is a biblical precedent even when it comes to certain matters of the law where there's an idea of not sweating the small stuff. We've recently been studying Leviticus in our Wednesday night class. And I've been mentioning over and over again that there is value in studying the not so desirable, shall we say, books of the Old Testament. In fact, some people believe that the Old Testament shouldn't be studied at all. But every time I look into these places that look as though they are not relevant today, I always gain new insight. One of the great questions I have about the teachings of Jesus, for example, is in Matthew chapter 9 when he said, go and learn the meaning of this uh, saying that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's always been a tough one for me. I think I know it when I see it, but if you ask me to define exactly what Jesus meant when he said that, I'd have a really tough time with it. But in our recent study of Leviticus, once again, I'm sure I still don't know if I could define it well for you, but I can show you a lot of places where if you ask me, why was this the law? The answer seems to be, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In fact, you can go as far back as the end of Exodus to see some of that. Uh, it was the law, for example, that God had the rights to the firstborn of every single person in the nation of Israel, but he did not take it and said he allowed them to, in fact, he commanded that they do so in this case, redeem that, the blood of their firstborn with the blood of a lamb. You ask the question, why? Because I desire mercy and not sacrifice, says God. In fact, you don't even have to uh, sacrifice your expensive animals like your cows or something. You can also redeem that with the blood of the lamb. Why? Because I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And you keep looking through all of these laws and you see all this emphasis on holiness that is put on there. And you keep seeing all of these things. But every once in a while, the strictness of the law is let loose. Nobody can eat of the sacrificed food except of the priest, except the families who depend on them. And a daughter can't eat of that if she's been married to somebody who is not a priest. But then if later that person she married, is married to dies and she has to go back to her father's house, then she can eat of this. Is it because the holiness of that particular uh, thing mattered less? No, it's because God desired mercy and not sacrifice. I need sin offerings. I, can, I have the right to take your life for sin, but instead I'm going to allow you to redeem yourself by the blood of a sacrifice. Why? Because I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And if you can't afford the cow for a sacrifice, you can offer a sheep or a goat instead because that's less expensive. Why? Because I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And if you can't afford the sheep or the goat, you can also just give us a couple of birds. Why? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So it's interesting how that is within the law, but that's not necessarily what we're talking about this morning. We're not talking about the places in which God makes allowances for us for our own needs, although the love of God through doing this is made abundantly clear. But I'd like to talk about the times when it is appropriate to, quote unquote, sweat the small stuff. Three places, in fact, I want to look at concerning our religious lives, shall we say. First of all, sweating the small stuff when it comes to doctrine. If you would, turn to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, the Bible reads, and this is Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches them, 
uh, and teaches others to do the same thing will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says to his audience, and, and by the way, in this particular context, he is talking about that Old Testament law, and he's talking about the fulfillment of that within him and how he's not destroying that old law but fulfilling it. But he's also giving us another important truth at the same time, which is that we have an obligation to keep the entirety of the law. I mentioned the doctrine, and doctrine is almost a dirty word in the religious world nowadays. It seems that it has become synonymous in the minds of many with dogma. But that is not the same thing. And doctrine is something that is important to God. What does doctrine mean? It simply means the teachings of, well, God in this case, the teachings of the Bible. And when we look into those teachings, it's easy for us to prioritize differently, saying this is important, this is not this is clearly a big thing, this is something small, and I can overlook that sort of thing. But look at what Jesus has to say about the doctrine that we are following. He says that not a dot, not an iota, you might say, uh, your version might read a jot or a tittle, the uh, same idea is given across, like it's talking about a dot or an iota, that's a two Greek letters. A dot is exactly what it sounds like, and an iota is basically a slightly curved lowercase i. The ideas are very, very small characters being put here. And all those things that look like they are small are still very important. We have to be sure to bind those things and make sure we are careful in everything. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And how many times have we seen, especially in the denominational world, some of these laws being relaxed or other laws being bound upon? It is the great problem, I suppose, of doctrine throughout all of history. We might be tempted to look at our own situation right now, see the denominational world and think that this is unique, but the, the truth is it hasn't been unique at all. Satan, after all, does not need us to be completely the opposite of Christians in every feasible way. I suppose he doesn't need us to be Satan worshipers in order to take us away from God. He only needs us to ignore just one commandment. We have to be diligent and vigilant against these things. We have to be careful that absolutely everything we are doing is in the way God would have us to do. That requires a few things. That requires careful study on our part, and that requires careful, independent study, which means we cannot depend on those around us, no matter how much we trust them, no matter how much we love them. And I have been extremely blessed in my life to know some people who have been um, incredibly knowledgeable in the Bible in a way that I can't hope to approach, who have been loving and extremely uh, crucial in their doctrine. And yet, even I can't make the mistake of fully depending on them. There is a reason that it is said that those in Thessalonica, or, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, that those in Berea were, not, uh, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. It's because they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. If you've ever wondered why it is when I mention a scripture that so many people are turning in their Bibles, there's a reason. It's not because they don't trust me. At least I don't think that's the reason. Maybe a couple of you don't, and I'm not going to blame you for it. It doesn't really matter if you trust me or not, though. I want you to do that. Because I'm an honest person, but there are a lot of people who will say they're honest people and they'll lie to you. Is that not so? And I'll also tell you this. I'm not always right. I mess things up. I mess things up a lot, as a matter of fact. We have an obligation to make sure for ourselves that what we are doing and everything that we are offering up is worship to God. Because something else I have learned from Leviticus this last pass through is how absolutely crucial those holy things that are offered up to God, being holy and perfect, how crucial that is. We need to make sure for ourselves what we are doing is right.
So we have to uh, sweat the small stuff when it comes to our doctrine. Now our doctrine, while being similar to the second thing I'd like to consider, has a, uh, there, there is a slight difference between our doctrine and then our personal morality. Our doctrine is our teachings. It is what we worship. It, it is how we worship. But our personal morality, at least as I'm defining it, is our daily lives, the, how we interact with sin. Now, it has been said uh, in the church, and falsely so, that all sin is the same. That isn't true. When we go to John chapter 19, Jesus tells Pilate that the sin of those who delivered him to Pilate was greater than Pilate's own sin. You'll recall that, of course, Pilate uh, was not free of sin, but he wasn't desiring to crucify Christ. It was the, those who were actually trying to crucify him who had the greater sin. Now, I don't usually make too much of a fuss about this, although technically it's not true that all sin is the same, because all, all sin is the same in certain aspects. All sin is the same in damnability. That is, there is destruction as a consequence for all sin, no matter how big we th happen to think it is. Another thing is, although all sin is not the same, there's not a ranking list in the Bible to let us know what is better and what is worse. I think that's pretty wise. It'd be easy for us to become arrogant and say, well, at least I don't do this thing. In fact, that's what we still do anyway, despite the fact that there is no ranking list in the Bible of what sin is bad, what sin is good. And as I said, that knowledge could cause us to become arrogant and to say, well, I'm not guilty of this sin. But the truth is, when we look back on ourselves, we all recognize a certain, a certain amount of grievous sin. And so I might think lying is not as bad as murder. But the Bible treats both of them with a lot of contempt, does it not? And we have an important responsibility to make sure that we are avoiding what we may think of as the small sins. If you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to the God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The Bible tells us that we have to look carefully at what we are doing. I appreciate translations here that will translate that walk circumspectly. And it's sort of a give and take when you translated that because circumspectly is about the perfect word for it. The problem is not a lot of people know what circumspectly means. But it's one of those words you can kind of break down into the different parts and you figure it out. Uh, when you ever hear circum or anything like that, it's probably going to be talking about a circle. And then you hear spect, like spectacle, and you figure out that's looking in a circle. Literally, it means to be looking around you at all times. And we get the idea that's being put out there. Watch where you're going. Watch your set. Be careful where you are going. Look out for every single possible danger. As it's like you're walking through a dirt path and somebody told you it was filled with rattlesnakes is the idea that's being given here. You have to be careful where you are walking and you watch out for any of the dangers that might be involved with it. I mentioned before that Satan does not need us to become Satan worshipers in order for us to lose our souls. At the same time, he doesn't need us to be what we might consider as man to be the great sins. He doesn't need us to be mass murderers in order for us to lose our souls. He needs us to not care about some small sins. One of the great ideas of the Bible, and, and there are a question a lot of people have, is how good is good enough? How am I know am I being a good enough Christian? Am I good enough to go to heaven and that sort of thing? But the question itself is, uh, isn't right. The question is not, are we good enough to become Christians? 
uh, or are we good enough to have our soul saved? The question of Christianity and whether or not we are Christians and we are walking in the light is, are we striving? And that's the trick of Satan, you see. He just has to get us to ignore one little sin. It's not necessarily that there are little sins, at least by our thinking, little sins in our life, but that we don't care about it anymore. And we think, this sin is a little sin. I'm not going to fight against it. I'm just going to avoid doing the big things. That's all the devil needs for us to lose our souls. So we have an obligation in our personal lives to watch out for those little things as well and to walk circumspectly and to sweat that small stuff. Finally, last thing I want us to consider about sweating the small stuff is not just in what we avoid, in evil, but when we actively do good as well. Our scripture reading was in Galatians chapter 6. Turn there if you would. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 6, says, Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh and will from the flesh corruption will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap. For if we do not give up, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I've mentioned before that morality is not a passive thing. Where morality is not something where you simply say, I am not going to do this, I am not going to do this, I am not going to do this, and then I will be good. But morality is something that is active. It is something that you are doing at all times. It is not good enough to not do evil. We also must do good. And often that can be the more challenging thing. But Paul reminds the Galatians, let us not grow weary in the work of doing good. James gives a similar idea in James chapter 4, in verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Tell you what, that to me might be, might be one of the verses in the Bible that has caused me a lot of frustration. And what I mean by that is this, sometimes I might be uh, just out and about in some capacity and I will see just some small thing, some, something out of place or something I know that I can easily fix and I'll think to myself, oh, that's not my job, I'll just let whoever, you know, that I'll let whoever the problem is, he can figure that out for himself. And then this verse comes into my head and I think, oh. <laughs> I gotta go do something about that. By the way, I'm not bragging. I'm not saying how great I am because those are very small things. What we're saying, what we need to do here, this is indeed some great things. And perhaps this is one of the last verses a Christian ought to study, at least for the first time, because it changes so much for us what morality is, that not only are we to avoid evil, but if we avoid doing good, then we have done evil. The Bible teaches us that there is no such thing thing as neutral. Ignoring an act is the same as doing something equal here. That's a difficult teaching of the Bible. And that tells us something so crucially important. I say it's a difficult teaching of the Bible, not because of the results, by the way, because talking about those small things that I might do, I've never looked back and regretted that I did something like that. I might be unhappy about it in the moment because of my, you know, 10-year-old brain and all that sort of thing going on here. But what we're dealing with in the, uh, in the long term, we find out that it's only ever good for us. There is no burden in doing good to those who are around you. There's a reason, by the way, Paul says, especially to those who are of the household of faith, because there is, uh, there is a certain more satisfaction. I got to tell you, I tend to like doing good for a good person more than I do for a wicked person. But that doesn't mean we avoid doing good towards the wicked person, does it? In fact, when we do good towards the wicked person, there is more potential for reward. 
if I do good for a good person, then I've done nothing for them except perhaps help them in the physical life a little bit. Maybe encourage them spiritually a little bit. Maybe. But think how much more powerful that is towards the wicked person, towards the worldly person, to the person who does not know God. That's when there's a potential life changer. It's easy to say to ourselves, well, this is not my responsibility. But the responsibility of all of those who are around us is our responsibility. One more time, going back into the Old Testament law, I'm always, um, I always tend to find the more I study the Old Testament, it's a lot more similar to the New Testament than I used to think. The same concept as we've just been talking about is given in the Old Testament. You know that? It doesn't say it uh, in such a general term, but the same concept is given. It says if you, you see your neighbor's ox wandering about, you're not just supposed to ignore it. You're supposed to get it and put it back in your neighbor's field like you would do if it was your own ox. See to the needs of others as if it were your own needs. And we can look at all of these things we've talked about. We can look at the doctrinal thing. And so many, people, so many people do look at doctrine and say, well, this is a small thing. I don't need to bother with it. Or they'll look at the personal sins and say, well, yes, I have some sins, but they're small sins. I don't need to bother with it. Or they'll see the potential to do good and they'll think, yes, I could do something here, but I'm not going to bother with it. I'm not going to sweat the small stuff. I'm here to tell you in all those cases, sweat the small stuff. Because in the eyes of God, it's not a small thing. There is no part of God's message that was given to us because it was unimportant. You know, when man gives a message, we often might put on unimportant things. You could probably, you know, take the recording of my sermon right now, and you could cut out a lot, and everything important might still be there. Because I am human, I put occasionally unimportant things along with it. God is not as we are, though. There is nothing unimportant with God. And when he has told us to do these things that to us look unimportant, have faith in God over yourself, what the small stuff really is. And that's what the important things are. If you find yourself right now in a place where you are currently separated from God, I'm here to tell you that you're certainly not alone. Every Christian in this room was at one point separated from God by their own personal sin. It's a terrible place to be, but it does not have to be the place where you remain. We love you, and God loves you, and God desires so greatly that you would return to him. He has proven this through his own actions. And he has no greater desire than to see you obtain salvation. If you want to know what you have to do, a whole crowd of people wanted to know in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 when they said to the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered and said to them, repent to be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, to your children, and to all those who are far off and as many as the Lord will call. If you've yet to obey, that calls for you. Why don't you come as we stand and sing? So